If we're looking at Joshua, let's begin reading here in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. And uh, I'll, I'll read the first uh, nine verses. And I'm going to give you some background, not a whole lot, you know, but enough to help us to, um, to step into this study with some understanding. And then we'll move into chapter 1 and look at the entire chapter. We'll look at chapter 1 today. And so we begin our, uh, our study here in the, in the uh, book of Joshua, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 9. We read these words. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous." that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so let me give you some background as we begin this, and then we'll get into our study here in Joshua chapter 1. I begin by noting that conservative Bible scholars believe that the author of the book of Joshua is no, no one other than Joshua himself. You see that in chapter 24 verse 26, and this book, being written after um, the book of Deuteronomy, is dated between the years 1405 B.C. and 1390 B.C. And as we go through this book, we're going to see that it covers Israel's taking and settling into Canaan, as well as dividing this land of promise into portions that were allocated to the tribes of Israel. We know that Joshua was Moses' assistant. We know that he was intended by God to, to succeed Moses as the second leader in the nation of Israel. Exodus 24, 13 speaks of him in this way. Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And so Moses had an assistant by the name of Joshua. Now, Moses, in his leadership had been with the children of Israel all during their, their wilderness wandering. And uh, at a certain point in his time with them, the children of Israel had complained. They had complained that they were thirsty. And so Moses got upset with them. Moses got upset at their murmuring. And so he took this concern to the Lord, and the Lord God spoke to him and gave him, a, him an instruction and God said to him, speak to a rock, and that rock will provide water. But because he was upset, the Bible tells us that he struck that rock, and he did so two times. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 12, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and this is what he said, Because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. And so Moses never had the ability of actually walking into the land of promise that he had led the nation of Israel in that wilderness for 40 years in anticipation of doing. So instead of Moses entering in with the children of Israel, the Lord took Moses and Joshua became the, the leader. Joshua was given the blessing of bringing the children of Israel into what was called the promised land. And so 
obviously this is a book concerning the man who did that. It's called Joshua. He's the main character. Now, he was called Hosea in Numbers 13, verse 8. But according to Numbers 13, verse 16, Moses changed his name from Hosea to Joshua. Now, there's a reason for that. Hosea means salvation. But Joshua means the Lord is salvation. Joshua is the Hebrew word for Jesus. Jesus is the Greek word. And so his name change is significant because it is a, a name change that relates to Israel entering into the promised land. You see, Joshua may lead the nation in the conquest, but the Lord is the conqueror. That is something that was made clear by Moses when he spoke to the children of Israel before they went in. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 2 through 4, he had said, It shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. Do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So it's God who is going before them. It's God who is fighting that battle. And it's God who saves them. So it's significant that Jehoshua or Joshua, the Lord is salvation, would be his name. Joshua's role of leading Israel triumphantly into possessing the land is something that actually foreshadows the work of Jesus Christ on our part. Joshua brings them into the promised land, which would be a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus bringing us into glory. In Hebrews 2.10, it says, It was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In Romans 8.37, it says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we're going to be seeing in the book of Joshua that it is actually a book of courage, confidence, and conquest. And we're going to see how the Lord works because he has demonstrated that, that he would be the one who fights on their behalf and they would be able to enter into the promises because God fights their battles. And that's a picture of Jesus Christ in the New Testament who goes before us and makes us more than conquerors through him. He, we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Because we don't just conquer one enemy, whether it's sin, death, hell, or Satan. It, it, we, we conquer them all in Jesus Christ, and nothing remains unsubdued. And so the Lord God is giving to us a picture in Joshua of him taking the land to remind us that Jesus Christ is the one who is giving to us the promises of God and that we can follow him and have victory. And so as we look at this, that's kind of your background. Let's begin looking at this verse by verse, verses 1 and 2 after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. It's interesting to me to note that when Moses is spoken of, uh, it's interesting how God doesn't refer to him as Moses, my leader. It's interesting that he speaks of him as Moses, my servant, because God will speak to those whom he is choosing to use in that way. Moses, my servant, Caleb, my servant, David, my servant. And so what we have here is a picture of Moses, who is known as being the servant of of the Lord. And it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the children of Israel. So, the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament, ends with the death of Moses. What we have in, in the book of Joshua is a continuation of God working through that nation. So Joshua is going to win the victory that Moses was unable to achieve. Again, Joshua is going to show us what God's mercy and grace does, where the, where the law of Moses really would fail. And so what this will give us a picture of is how that we'll have a victory that is unreachable uh, by just following the law of Moses. See, Moses died. But just because a leader dies doesn't mean that God ceases working. When it states here, after the death of Moses, there are those who would say, who could replace him? Who has the ability of stepping into the shoes that were so unbelievably, in, it was unbelievably great, and so who can step into those shoes? Who can, who can do what Moses did? No human being, no matter how great that person may be, 
is ever irreplaceable. When Moses is gone, there's always a Joshua. There's always a Joshua standing in the wings. God doesn't rely on just one leader, but God raises up a series of leaders. And you'll see this. And Joshua was the one that God chose to raise up. And so he says, Moses is dead, but I'm going to give to you the ability to lead this people in. And notice verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward going down on the sun, shall be your territory. So every place that the sole of your foot will tread, notice, I have given to you, even as I said to Moses. And so when you remember what God said to Moses, if you take notes, Deuteronomy 11:24, God had said, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness uh, and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. So when you look at a map geographically, when he speaks of the western border, that would be the Mediterranean Sea. The eastern border would be the Euphrates River. Now the Euphrates River runs from central Turkey down south and continues south through Syria and Iraq and empties into the Persian Gulf. So that's a good chunk of land. The northernmost portion would be in Lebanon and that southern runs all the way down to the Nile River there in Egypt. So this is a large portion of land. Interestingly, I want you to notice this in verse 4. He speaks of the land of the Hittites. The word Hittite, or when he uses the word Hittites, the land of the Hittites is really just a word that's kind of generic to speak of the other peoples that live there. When you study the Bible and you look at the promises of God as it relates to this, you discover that, that God actually in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, speaks concerning these nations, he said, that are greater than the Jews. He names them the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Uptites, Outisites, Cellulites. There's so many ites. They're everywhere. That's an old joke, and I love it. I mean, I, I, I just enjoy saying that so much. So the Hittites is actually a generic word that is speaking of all of these people groups. And God said, these are seven nations that are greater than you. And God is saying, I'm giving you this land. Now, we need to rehearse a little bit of the Jewish history in order to get what's going on so I can develop this with you a little bit. We need to remember that years before, God had allowed 12 spies to enter into the land. They had really wanted to go in to spy out this land that God had promised them. And so these leaders that represented the 12 tribes of Israel were selected. And so there were 12 men that were selected to go in and spy out the land that God had promised to the nation. Now, they went out and they, they spent many days there. They came back. And uh, when they began to give their reports, 10 of the spies gave a very negative report. The, the report was so negative that the result was incredible discouragement to all the people. When they were speaking, they said, yes, th this is a land that is flowing with milk and honey indeed. And we even brought some of the uh, fruit of the land to show you how incredibly lush it really is. It's, it's a beautiful land. But as we were looking at it, we noted something Numbers 13, 33 says that they said, there we saw giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. We saw giants in the land. I mean, when we showed up, yes, the land is great, the land is beautiful, but there are these huge human beings that are there, and we, we were as small as a grasshopper in their sight, and just by comparing ourselves with them, we were grasshoppers in our own sight. And basically what they were saying is, if we go in, we, we're dead. There's no way that we can take these cities and there's no way we can overcome the inhabitants of the land. And they brought a discouraging word. Numbers 14 verse 1 says, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. They were so upset. We don't want to go in. Let's just kill Moses. I'm so upset. What's going on here? But there were two others who were there, the other two out of the 12, Joshua and Caleb. They saw the same thing. And yet as they saw the same thing, they, they wanted to enter in. They, they knew. Caleb said, I can go in. Let's take it. God has given it to us. 
Well, God became angry. God became angry with them because of their unbelief. Numbers chapter 14, verses 28 through 32 records how that God said, Say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. They shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. The children of Israel were afraid to enter in because the land was filled with giants. They had cried out and said, we're afraid we're going to die there. God said, as you have spoken, so shall it be done. You're concerned that your children are going to die? I'll take your children in safely. You, you will wander in this wilderness and you will die without ever seeing the promised land because of what you've said and what you've done. Now, the people that had caused such fear to rise in the hearts of the spies, these giants and all of these people are still there in the land. They haven't been displaced. And so a spiritual challenge or something we can learn is that uh, challenges don't just go away because you ignore them. And sometimes if you give them enough time, they actually even grow. And so these giants didn't go away just because the people of Israel were afraid to, to combat them. And by the way, they had forgotten that God said, I have given you the land. They had forgotten that God said he would go before them and fight for them. Perhaps it was simply their unbelief. They didn't believe that he would do such a thing. And so they were afraid to go, and they're still afraid. And that's why in verse 5, that's why it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. My work did not end with Moses. My work is going to continue through you. Though men die, God's work continues. If you begin to look into even the, not real recent, but relatively recent history of the Christian faith, and you begin to look at some of the lives of and the names, remember some of the names of those who were known as great evangelists, you begin to wonder, well, when this person dies, what's going to happen? You have a guy by the name of John Wesley, great evangelist. He lived in the 17, early 1700s. John Wesley dies. But there's another man who's still around during that time who continues that kind of work. His name was George Whitfield. What happens with George Whitfield? Well, there's another man by the name of D.L. Moody. What happens when D.L. Moody stops having his impact? There's another man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Well, what happens when Charles Spurgeon is no longer making an impact? You've got R.A. Torrey. Well, how about when he's no longer? How about William Booth? Well, what happens when William Booth is no longer around? How about Billy Sunday? What happens when Billy Sunday is no longer around? How about Billy Graham? God has men and women that he raises up to use in the times that they're needed. Just because we don't have an individual with us anymore doesn't mean that God ceases working. There's a, a very good Bible teacher that everybody's probably heard of, J. Vernon McGee. And J. Vernon McGee was ill, and he, he made a statement. I've never forgotten. I'll paraphrase what he said. But he said, you know, I began to wonder what was going to happen should I die, because he was very ill. And he thought, who is going to, or actually it was before he got ill. He said, I wonder who will step in and uh, do the work that God has been using me to do. He said, and then I got very ill. When I got very ill, he said, it was then that the Lord began to speak to my heart and told me a very simple thing. In essence, he said, I really don't need you. And that's true. You, you know, let's bring this home to those who are Calvary Chapel people. What's going to happen when Pastor Chuck is no longer with us? Pastor Chuck would answer by saying, Jesus is. So that's the whole key, isn't it? It's never been one man. It's always been 
Jesus Christ. It's always been God himself. It's always been the Lord doing the work. Just because Moses is dead doesn't mean that God stops working. When Moses is dead, God raises up a Joshua, and God begins to use this man, Joshua. When the Lord takes Pastor Chuck home, God is already raising up people who will do what God wants them to do the way Pastor Chuck did, or whomever may be one of your favorite speakers and teachers. That's what's going to happen. As long as the Lord continues to work on the face of the earth, God will select leaders that he'll use to do that work. It's not up to me or up to us to elect and determine who that is. It's up to God. And God has a way of doing that. God has a way of reaching down and touching somebody and using them. I was sharing at a church not long ago. I was ministering, actually at a youth pastor's conference. And I was speaking to the youth pastors, and I said a very basic, very simple truth. I said, should the Lord tarry, you youth pastors are right now more than likely raising the next pastor of the church. You right now are influencing the next minister who will step into that pulpit to lead the church into the future. If he's there right now as a young boy, one day he'll be a young man. And your influence is timeless. It's going to go on and on and on. Right now in this church, right now on a Wednesday night, there may be a little boy in one of the classes, just a little guy who's there getting taught, who one day will be standing in this platform leading this church. I pray that that is so. I pray that he's only one or two. That gives me a lot more years. <laughs> but that little guy may be there right now. And somebody is influencing him as the Lord is ministering to them because one day they will be raised up and they'll be used by God. So just because Moses is dead doesn't mean that God no longer works. Just because a very important and key leader in the history of Israel is no longer with them doesn't mean that God isn't going to fulfill his promises. Moses, my servant, is dead. But you, Joshua, his assistant, will be leading my children into the promises that I have prepared for them. No one shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, he says to him. So I will be with you. And then he goes on to say, I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you on your own. God's promises remain the same. I will be with you. My power and my presence will remain with you. I will be with you. And not only does God's power and presence remain with Joshua, but by way of application, God's presence and power remains with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. How do I know that? Well, I want you to notice this. This is found in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. But it is quoted in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5. In the New Testament, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is with you. No matter what you go through, no matter what you're enduring, no matter what the challenge may be before you, God is with you. God does not abandon you. God does not forsake you. God does not leave you orphans. Jesus said, I will come to you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will abide with you and will be in you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will empower you. He will strengthen you. And so these are promises, though it's found in the Old Testament, that are repeated in the New. When you go out to do a work for the Lord, you are never alone. When you go out to do something in the name of Jesus Christ, it's not supposed to be in your power and you are not abandoned. God will give you what he has set before you to do. What he's determined will be accomplished through you. He will do it. But he wants you to know that. Some people are afraid to step out and do something because they don't know if God will abandon them and make them look foolish when they attempt to do something for him. God is saying to Joshua, I will not forsake you. I will be with you. The way that I was with Moses all those years and you saw you were his assistant. You were side by side with him. You saw what I did in and through Moses. He said, you've had all of this training, Joshua. I will be 
with you. There are people in this room that God is speaking to and has been for some time saying to you, you need to step out in faith and do something for me. And a lot of times what you have done is quench the Holy Spirit and said, no, that's got to be somebody else. He really wants to do it through somebody else. And God has been saying, no, I want to do it through you. Trust me. Step out. See what God will do. Just be in the place and be prepared. And you'll see how that happens in just a moment. But be ready to be used. He says, be strong, verse 6, and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. When he says, be strong and of good courage, it's another way of saying, don't be somebody who's simply got great character, but be a man of action. Be alert. Be ready to act when the occasion arises. Be there ready. When I used to play baseball in Little League, I would sit on the bench if they didn't have me playing, but I would sit there with my glove in my hand. I was ready to play the moment that the coach said, step on in. I've never been one of these guys, and I don't think I have very many people in this room who are this way, but I've never been one of these people who want to sit the bench. I don't want to sit the bench. I want to not only put on the uniform, I want to get it dirty. I don't want to just put the glove on my hand. I want to use it to play. I don't want to just take batting practice. I want to stand up and actually take some swings at some guy who's throwing the ball at me. I want to do that. I want to hit the ball. I want to run. I want to slide. I want to play. I don't want to sit the bench. And a lot of people, unfortunately, sit the bench. But in reality, God says, are you ready to play? And sometimes they're just not ready to play. Sometimes they don't care about it enough to even want to enter in. But me, I'm one of these people who wants to be what God is saying to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. It's not that just that you should have strong faith. You need to be ready. God can call you to move at any given moment. At any moment, the need may arise where he calls you and says, are you ready? You might find this interesting. My staff has been instructed. There are several members of my staff that are instructed to have what we call a sermon in the pocket. You have to have a sermon in your pocket. What does that mean? What if I don't make it to church on a Sunday? What if I don't make it on a Wednesday? Something happens. You know, it's a good baseball game on or something. No, what, what, what happens? <laughs> what happens? What happens if Pastor David doesn't make it? You've got to have a sermon in your pocket. It scares them. I have to be honest with you. There's been times I've been late that they're just pacing in and they're praying like they've never prayed before. <laughs> oh, God, please bring him. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, bring him. I do not want to go out there. Because the bottom line is, is it can be difficult to come out and do three services on a Sunday. And they know that. And so I've told them, you need to be ready. You should have an ability at any given time to give what God has placed on your heart. I was at a men's conference about 15 plus years ago now at Calvary Chapel South Bay, sitting in the front row. And it was a conference, a men's conference. The theme was servanthood. And I was seated in the front row when Pastor Chuck, Chuck got up. I was the second speaker. Pastor Chuck got up and gave the message that I had prepared. John 13. And I'm sitting there looking at my notes, John 13, as Chuck is giving this message. And Chuck takes about 35 minutes to 40 minutes. And I turned to Steve Mays, who's seated next to me, and I said, I'm dead. <laughs> and he says, what's wrong? And I just show him my notes. And he looks at me and he goes, oh. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And so Chuck finishes his message. Well, during his message, he thought I was taking notes. I wasn't. During his message, I had opened up the Bible, and I couldn't get up and walk out. I had to sit in the front row there as he's teaching, and he thinks, what a great student David is. No, Pastor, no, no. I was writing an entire sermon out because I had a 40-minute message to give after he finished. And then they had a 10-minute break, and Pastor Chuck came and sat next to me. And I said, Chuck, you just gave the message I was going to give. He says, no. I said, yes. And I showed him my notes, and he starts to laugh. That's the compassion that this man had for me. <laughs> What are you going to do? <laughs> and I got up after a 10-minute break, 
and gave an entirely different message. You have to be able to do that. You have to be able at any given moment to put something down that the Lord has freshly put on your heart to share. Joshua, be a man of action. Be ready. Be somebody who's got that courage and confidence to know that I'm going to take you through. Be ready. Be prepared. Be ready to act. Don't be caught and thinking, oh, no, what am I going to do? You need to be instant, in season and out of season. You see, if you're walking with the Lord and you're reading his word and you're spending time in prayer and you're having fellowship with other brothers and sisters, you're always ready. If you're in your devotions, if you're in Bible studies, if you saturate your life with reading, you're always ready. You will always have something you can share because you're supposed to be ready at any given moment because you don't know when God is going to say, it's your turn, come on in, the game's on, I need you here. And if you're just there eating a snow cone, chewing on the end of your glove, it's probably not going to work. He wants you to be ready to step in. So you are ready, aren't you? You have to be. You should be at any given moment. You're on the job site and somebody brings up the subject of something that has some moral question to it. You ought to be ready to give an answer. You ought to know the word well enough to be able to say, you know what, this is what the Bible says about that. You will be surprised how God gives you so many opportunities, but unfortunately so often we're just not ready. But the Lord gives us opportunity. Have you ever been in that position where you've said, oh, man, I just read something. I wish I could remember. I've done that so many times. I've just read. And the Lord has taught me, be ready, be ready, because you never know when I'm going to call on you. I went on vacation. I'm sitting in the back row at, at Harvest Christian Fellowship in Manhattan. And as I'm seated there, a friend of mine who's a pastor, Mike Venezio, comes walking up to me during the service. There's some worship. And then he walks up and says, Dave, he says, we're going to have communion. He said, I notice you're here. Can you serve it? Give a word to the people. And so I said, well, of course. So I'm sitting there. Ten minutes later, I'm standing in front of his congregation, giving a word about what the Lord wants to do, sharing communion, because you have to be ready whenever God calls you. Yes, Lord, I'm ready. Here am I. Send me. That's Joshua. So God says, listen, Moses is dead. Moses is dead. But I'm going to use you. Just because Moses is dead doesn't mean that God stops working. Joshua, I'm going to use you. I'm going to fulfill my promises through you. You're going to lead the people in. Therefore, he says, be strong and of good courage. He goes on in verse 7 and says, again, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn uh, from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and very courageous. What we really have here are foundations for biblical leadership. How can I become strong and how can I live victoriously? Well, the way that's going to take place, and I want you to notice this, is God through God's guarantee. God has guaranteed his presence his power, and he has supplied his promises through the word of God. What is going to make Joshua a powerful, victorious leader in Israel? Well, he says what is going to be. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. When he speaks of this book of the law, it would specifically refer to the books that they have at that time from Genesis to Deuteronomy. But he's saying, within my word, you will find my blessings. And within my word, you will find my promises. Within my word, you will also find my warnings. And by meditating on these things, by holding fast to them, 
by mentally going over these things over and over thoroughly and habitually by paying careful attention and thoughtful attention to the word of God, God can use you. In Deuteronomy 7, 11 and 12, it says, Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which I command you today, to observe them. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you, uh, keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he has sworn to your fathers. So he says, meditate on it. God's word should be meditated on. Meditation for the Christian is not emptying your mind. There are forms of meditation where they will say to those who are meditating that you're to empty your mind. Christian meditation isn't the emptying of the mind. Christian meditation is the filling of the mind. You're meditating on God's word. You meditate on God's promises. Meditation has been likened to mentally chewing the word of God, actually just causing it to have a place in you. It's, it's the paying careful attention to God's word. That's the foundation. If I'm going to be a leader, and I'll make it personal, if I'm going to be a leader God uses, I need to meditate on his word. His word needs to be looked at as being more necessary than my daily food. His word is to be held fast to. His word is to be known, memorized. His word is to be not only known and memorized, it is to be applied. So it begins with meditation. He says, meditate on this. It shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. He says in verse 8 that you may observe to do according to all that is written. So not only am I to pay careful attention to the word of God, but I am also to be a doer of God's word and not a forgetful hearer. And I want you to notice that it's a command that you may observe to do. So here's something that will help us. We simply need to decide to do what God says. Sometimes we may be tempted to simply memorize what he says, but the best way to know a passage is to determine to obey it. And what it is that it says, if you want to grow in your relationship with God, determine to obey so it's not simply knowing the Bible. The Pharisees during the time of Christ knew the Bible, but they didn't know the God of the Bible. They could speak out of the Bible, but the Bible was not speaking into them. And Jesus spoke of that as saying it's hypocrisy. So what we do is not only meditate in it, but we observe it and we do what is written. He says, if that happens, notice again in verse 8, you will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. So hunger for God's word is important because we know that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So there's a hunger for God's word, but we also deeply consider and practice what God's word teaches. Now, if I have a hunger for the word of God, I deeply, deeply consider the word of God and I put into practice the word of God. He gives to me a blessing. You will prosper and you will have success. Your life is going to be blessed by God and you will also be skilled and wise in the way that you live. When he says you will have success, the word success in the ancient language in Hebrew speaks of being skilled in living. It speaks of you having wise living habits. God's word will give to you that which is necessary to produce a wisdom in you and your life will be blessed by him. Have I not, verse 9, commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm with you. I have commanded you. I have promised you. I will bless you. So trust me. My children, having a sin nature they receive from their mom, actually it's from the father. My, my children, when they were small, 
on occasion, if I had made a promise to them, would remind me of the promise. It wouldn't be exactly like this, but it could be something like this. Daddy, you said. Daddy, you said. They reminded me of what I said. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't do it too often. Because they really believe that dad is good to his word. I thought my dad was the most amazing man in the world when I was growing up. I thought my dad had control of the, over the weather. You see, one day we were supposed to go to a place called Disneyland. Disneyland had just been built. It was like in 1956, right around there, right in that area. And my mom had said, I've got a surprise for you. My brother and I were looking forward to whatever the surprise might be. I was looking forward to it because I knew whatever it was, it was going to be great. Now, I didn't know that it was going to Disneyland that the surprise was. I didn't know that because it was a surprise. They were keeping it to themselves. Well, long story made short, the day that we were supposed to go for this surprise, it rained. And so there's no way we're going to Disneyland in the rain. Now, my mom and dad had promised us a surprise. You know what they did? They put us in the car and they drove us to my aunt's house, <laughs> who lived in Venice. <laughs> we stopped and got a hamburger. I remember this day very well. But I didn't know we were supposed to go to Disneyland. All I know is that we pulled over and we had a hamburger. And we drove to my aunt's house, and when we pulled up to the house, it began snowing. When does it snow in L.A.? And it's snowing. And I still remember jumping up and down with my brother as the snow was falling. We'd never seen snow. Saying, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Because I thought my dad made it snow as a surprise. You know, my mom didn't tell me that he didn't for a long time. The real surprise was Disneyland. But you can, and we didn't go. What a rip. But the snow was cool. <laughs> but you believe. Daddy, you said, Daddy, you said you would. Well, you know what the Lord has done? The Lord has said, I will do this. It would be a good idea if we learned his promises and in faith if we said, not in the kind of haranguing, I want my way voice, but Lord, you have said. Lord, you have said, and I'm going to trust you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to trust you. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust you. I am a person who is going to be blessed by God because you have promised that you would bless me. I'm going to trust you. You said you would supply my need according to your riches. I'm going to trust you. What's my option? To not trust him. Now, if God said it, will he not do it? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should change his mind. If God has said it, he will do it. And so my responsibility isn't to set him on a timetable and say, you haven't done it in the five minutes I gave to you, therefore there is no God. It's to wait on the Lord. And what he wants me to do and he wants you to do, this is where it gets difficult, is to trust him. And that's part of the reason we keep reading him saying similar things. Be strong and of good courage, verse 6. Verse 7, be strong and... A very and be very courageous verse 7 verse 9 be strong and of good courage do not be afraid nor dismayed he reminds us and reminds us and reminds us be men and women of action trust me have confidence in me be courageous in me have I not said I will never leave you nor forsake you have I not said I will give you these promises just trust me Makes sense to me. I'm with you. I've commanded you. I've promised you. I will bless you. So trust me. 
You trusted me when you were Moses' assistant. Now you must do so as the new leader. One of the things I've discovered in leadership is that people follow leaders who are confident in their leading. And if a person's going to be confident in their leading, they need to have a deep fellowship with God. Now, verse 10, Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And so he speaks, and notice with me in verse 10, to the officers. These officers would be similar to what we would call administrators. And he's saying, you need to go and you need to prepare these people to march. Now, as they're saying, the timeline is here, we're going to enter in. There must have been a wave of emotion that passed through the people. We're about to enter in after all of these years. And so he speaks, and he speaks. This is interesting to me. He speaks to the first Mexican tribe, to the Reubenites. Again, an old joke, but I love it. What? And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, on the east side of the Jordan, but you shall pass before your brethren armed all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest, as he has given you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. And so the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were those who were living on the east side of the Jordan, they had asked for that portion recorded in Numbers chapter 32, verses 20 through 28. So they received their portion of land, but they were going to go in and help to secure the other portions for the others. Finally, verse 16, they answered Joshua saying, All that you commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. The initial response in verse 16 is filled with hope and eagerness. We are ready to go. After years of waiting for the entrance to the land, we are ready to go. All you need to do is lead us. We followed Moses. We will follow you. When he says, just as we heeded Moses, well, the previous generation was marked by rebellion, but these are saying we will be loyal. The one thing that we're requiring of you is that you be courageous, and you be confident. Leadership is founded on faith, and it will be earmarked by a courageous confidence in the promises of God. People who are wise will follow the one who follows the Lord. When somebody is following the Lord, there's a wisdom that that person will have in their leadership that will encourage others who are of like mind. Churches, bring it to the 21st century, churches are filled with every level of maturity from the immature and beyond that to the spiritually unsaved, to the spiritually young, immature, to those who have been walking with the Lord for many years. The spiritual person is the individual who has the ability to see God's movement through the ones who are leading them. If the person who is leading is in the word of God, trusting in the promises of God, 
as a devotional life with God who can speak as one who's experienced with those things, if that leader evidences a courageous confidence in, in a God who is able to do all things abundantly above all we could ever ask or think, then those who follow along are going to be blessed along with that person. So a requirement is going to be what they're saying, be strong and be of good courage. Joshua, we're willing to go with you. We're willing to go into the land that a generation ago our fathers refused to go into. It's still got giants. It's still got battles. It still has a lot waiting for us that should cause us to fear. But we will follow you as you follow the Lord. And where you go, we will go. And every step you take, we'll take alongside of you. But make sure you lead us by being confident in the things of God, courageous in the things of God, remembering the promises of God, and walking in the fullness of the Spirit of God. We will follow you every step if you do those things. Joshua, we will follow you.